Sia. Sri Sukha Uvacha. Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, Hemante, during the winter, Pratame, in the first Masi month, Nandavraja, of the cowherd village of Nanda Maharaj, <coughs> Kumarikaha, the unmarried young girls, Cheru, performed Havasyam, unseasoned Kitri, unseasoned Kitri, Bujana, subsisting on Katyayani, of the goddess Katyayani, Archana Vritam, the vow of worship. Translation. Sukadev Goswami said, During the first month of the winter season, the young unmarried girls of Gokul observed the vow of worshipping goddess Katyayani. For the entire month, they ate only unspiced kitri. <laughs> Purport by the disciples of Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The word Hemanti refers to the month of Magashirsha from approximately the middle of November to the middle of December according to the Western calendar. In Volume 1, Chapter 22 of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Srila Prabhupada comments that the gopis first ate Havisyana, a kind of food prepared by boiling together mung dal and rice without any spices or turmeric. According to Vedic injunction, this kind of food is recommended to purify the body before one acts a ritualistic ceremony. End of purport. <clears throat> Om Agyan Timiranda Sya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithahananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Srivasadi Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, the beginning of this chapter describes a vrata, an austerity, performed by the gopis. <laughs> and uh, there's a time, there's a place, there's a form of worship, and there's a result. Every austerity must have a desired result and it should be performed according to regulative principles and according to the directions of the Shastras, mm -hmm. directions of the spiritual master. Here, the, the gopis, many of them, <laughs> were praying for months and months and months, actually for many, many months, to have Krishna as their husband. Krishna is the fulfiller of all of desires. Knowing the hearts of the gopis, to have them him exclusively as their uh, worshipful husband. Although the gopis were married, many of them were, and they had husbands who were cowherd men also. Still, Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran, Krishna is the only lovable 
and what we say relationship we actually have the relationships in this world <coughs> are based on the presence of the material body and so these relationships are always changing they're always temporary and they cannot give the full fulfillment of the desire of the persons involved in a relationship there's nothing perfect in any material relationship because it's temporary and it's based on something that is acquired that is the material body due to a we might say anartha or something that's unwanted in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the prayers offered by Rishabdev in the very beginning he says that the material body is something that is unnatural but we have a material body and so we use the material body for a purpose but all material relationships only when they are transformed into something spiritual reaches the goal of that relationship in which is devotion to Krishna so the gopis although married never considered themselves the wives of their husbands in the real sense they considered Krishna was their only husband <laughs> and this is instructive to understand there's another beautiful pastime in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Krishna is teasing Rukmini after Rukmini accepts Krishna as her husband. She rejects Shishupal, who was very enthusiastic to have her for his wife. And she sends a letter to Krishna, asking Krishna to kidnap her, which he does. And then, of course, the soldiers on the side of Shishupal fought with Krishna along with Balaram and were defeated in Krishna won the hand of Rukmini in a very interesting battle. And, uh, but now Krishna wants to test Rukmini's love. <laughs> so what, he's, what does he do? He somewhat chides her and jokes with her, but in a way that is very serious. When somebody seriously jokes with you sometimes, you can't tell if they're joking or not. Right? Sometimes... You have to really know the person well to understand if, the, if it's actually a joke or it's something serious. But sometimes we see that even jokes, actually a joke is actually something that is true but with a different twist. It has some element of reality in terms of material truth but it's twisted slightly to give some humor or some reverse understanding so Krishna was teasing Rukmini and saying actually you know you're very qualified very beautiful perfect in all respects my dear wife you know but actually you deserve much better than me <laughs> you deserve much better than me so he was trying to explain to her that actually she made a mistake <laughs> She made a mistake by choosing him over Shishupal. But it's not too late. Krishna said, even though you made this mistake, still you should, can go to Shishupal, it's still available. And actually, your choice for me was not based on any real intelligence. Because when a woman chooses a husband, of course, that's usually arranged. But still, there should be some intelligence based on matching up the personalities. And she, he said, you didn't even know my caste. You didn't even know my background. And, you know, so therefore, actually, you deserve much better than me. <laughs> well, we also, actually, we know there's nothing better than Krishna. <laughs> and Rukmini couldn't, what we say, assimilate or actually want to seriously take what he was saying but he continued on and on and on and their heart was becoming somewhat confused and bewildered and then she started to lament trying to say, 
because Krishna kept saying it in a very serious way, not letting out any form of humor. Although it was humorous from a third person perspective, from Krishna's point of view, he was very serious, and from her point of view, she was devastated. She was really devastated. Finally, she just fainted and gave up her external consciousness, <laughs> dropped to the ground. It says, like a whirlwind hit by a, ban- a banyan tree hit by a whirlwind. And finally, she came back to consciousness and she basically said, and she spoke very philosophically, what woman in this world would accept a body dec- and which is filled with mucus, blood, pus, bile, air, stool, so many other nice things, blood, marrow, and decorated with mustaches and beards and has hair on the head over you. Now what woman, what woman, that woman has no sense, basically, she said. Anyone who would accept something or some man in this world over you is actually not very intelligent. <laughs> and she went on to explain that. And uh, Krishna liked that. He wanted to bring out her uh, love and, she, and it worked very nicely. So here the gopis, they also know that who can accept you as a, uh, who can accept anyone other than you as the real husband. So Krishna knew her, their heart. And they wanted to prepare themselves. So they performed this, what they call virata. It's performed, it's still being done by many young and chaste girls today in different parts of India where they uh, worship goddess Katyanya, the goddess of fortune, goddess of fortune manifested as goddess Katyani. And they offer beautiful prayers to her and perform so many austerities. They bathe in a certain time of the morning in cold water and they have to eat this unspiced kitri every day for months. It's actually for a month. But preparing themselves ultimately for the ultimate vrata, it takes months to prepare yourself. They're, prefer- they're doing all kinds of other austerities until they get to this vrata. And then for an entire month, uh, they just offer prayer, beautiful prayers to Krishna. Of course, <coughs> because it's in the Shastras and it's also recommended, but devotees are also preparing themselves for bringing Krishna into our lives, bringing Krishna into our heart. And what is the austerity we perform? We perform the austerity of giving up the desire to enjoy material happiness (laughs) and accepting the holy name as one's ultimate and only shelter. That's our austerity. To chant the holy names and to open up the heart through the process of bhakti, which prepares for Krishna to, what they say, sit on the heart. We'll probably hear that in a few days. His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj will probably talk about the cleansing of the Gundicha temple, which is synonymous and an allegorious of cleansing the heart. And cleansing the heart means making a suitable seat for the Lord to sit within the heart. Lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy, and... I missed one. Lust, greed, illusion, pride, envy, and... Huh? Madness! That's pride. No. Lust, anger, no. Lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy. Okay. Mada, mada, madness means another form of madness is, is pride or false pride. So these things are what they call the dirts that sit within the heart. And through the process of bhakti, purifying the heart through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, the dirt gradually becomes dissipated. 
So the the gopis here are focusing exclusively on that vrata and not deviating their attention to any other thing. And this what it this is what it takes to become Krishna conscious. <laughs> one pointed attention on the goal, one pointed attention on the activities that lead to the goal. <laughs> not just knowing the goal, but performing the activities that lead to the goal. Of course, bhakti is an end in itself. All the activities of devotional service purify the heart. But the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is the most powerful and direct means iti soda sakam nam nam kali kamasanasanam nata parate opayo sarva vedishu drishyate. Lord Brahma speaks this verse describing that out of all the process of purifications that are mentioned in the Vedic literature, nothing is as powerful and as recommended as chanting these 16 names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. That's our austerity. Of course, we perform other austerities too. As recommended in the Shastras, as given by Srila Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas, and understood in a practical way. <laughs> and that those austerities are basically to constantly be aware that this material energy is simply a trap for the living entity. Before one can become fully Krishna conscious or become fixed in the process of bhakti, one has to be convinced that there is no happiness in the material world. As long as there is some pinch, Prabhupada says, pinch of desire, if there's some still element, one still looks towards material nature for some kind of satisfaction, some kind of pleasure then one cannot be fixed in the process of bhakti. Because <laughs> the mind gets deviated, the intelligence... Because the mind's business is to make plans, the intelligence business is to carry it out. So the mind is making plans and the intelligence is thinking how to fulfill that desire. The devotee knows that all material plans simply lead to, what we say, diversion away from the real goal. <laughs> So we make plans to serve Krishna. <laughs> we make plans to chant the holy names of the Lord. So now we're about to embark on a wonderful yatra, mm -hmm. Jagannath Puri, where these yatras are opportunities for complete absorption, holy association in the holy land, worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead in His most, what we say, transcendental form Jagannath <laughs> one devotee said to Prabhupada one time Jagannath he doesn't look like Krishna <laughs> and Prabhupada said not Krishna he's Krishna <laughs> for Prabhupada to hear such a thing it sounded quite unusual because Prabhupada is seeing Krishna in all the forms of Krishna. But when we see the two-handed form playing on the flute, we think, oh, that's Krishna. We see Jagannath. We think, oh, that is also Krishna. But it's in a very manifested form of separation. Krishna is in the mood of separation from the gopis. Or, yes, especially from Srimati Radharani. And so he manifests that beautiful form of separation He's also carrying his flute, as we heard from the beautiful prayer sung this morning. He plays on this flute. So devotees are preparing our consciousness in order to invite Lord Jagannath into, the, into our heart, into our life, like that. So preparing the consciousness really means to focus the mind on chanting the holy names of the Lord as much as possible. Because Krishna consciousness... <coughs> means to always keep conscious of Krishna. As soon as the mind gets diverted to any other thing, then that one can develop attachment for something. And due to that attachment, 
then the mind starts to make plans to enjoy. <laughs> and then one gradually, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, Dayate Vishayam Pumsam Sangat Sanjat Sangayate Sanjayate Kama Kama Krodha Bijayate Krodha Bhavati Samoham Samoham Sriti Vri Brahma Sriti Brahma Sa Burina Sa Burina Sa Panashiti and the pranashati means fall down. As soon as we contemplate material sense gratification, we we start this whole chain of reaction where the mind gradually starts to become more and more bewildered by the material energy until finally it, it becomes filled with material consciousness and one cannot remember Krishna. One cannot see the value of serving Krishna. So one should contemplate Krishna. The gopis were so absorbed in contemplating Krishna, performing these austerities, prepare, preparing themselves. What did the gopis have to do with austerities anyway? <laughs> they are on the highest spiritual platform. They have pure love for Krishna. But they wanted Krishna's special favor in this case. They wanted to Krishna to acknowledge that they would be their, their his eternal wives. And Krishna performed this pastime, as we will read later on. He allowed the gopis to become his wife by playing a trick on them. <laughs> Krishna is very tricky. <laughs> That's one thing we learn about devotional service. Krishna, you never know what Krishna is going to do. <laughs> He's very tricky. Prabhupada said, yes, Krishna is very tricky. And, but his tricks are always for the interest of all the living entities. <coughs> he tricks us into surrendering. <laughs> As one devotee will, tells one story where one man, he, he was on book distribution in California. <coughs> and so he was, he was doing books and he met this one man and he gave him a book. And then that was the end of that. And then that man left California, went to New York just recently after that. And he was walking in again. Some book distributor came up and gave him a book. He said, I just met you guys in California and you're here in New York too. So everywhere I go, you're, you, you're there. <laughs> so that's Krishna. <laughs> Trying to trick us, tricking, tricking the conditioned souls into taking into devotional service. So this is a beautiful chapter. We go into the essence of this chapter as the, we see what Krishna does to the gopis. So one should accept whatever Krishna does as the best thing for devotion, for devotees' purification. Tate nu kampa shusha mikshamanam bujane vakritam vipakam vidva vahabir vidadan namaste jivetia mukti padeshadaya bhak. That Krishna puts the devotees into difficult situations, but their own the situations sometimes are simply due to one seeing the situation in the wrong way. There's no difficult situation in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes devotees ask the question, <coughs> Well, how do we know whether it's Krishna's arrangement or Maya's arrangement? We find ourselves in the situation. Is it Krishna's arrangement or Maya's arrangement? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> the arrangement is made in such a way as so you can somehow become purified and remember Krishna. If you forget Krishna, then... then in these circumstances, then it's completely Maya. But we can easily, Maya also arranges uh, for us to somehow or other take shelter of Krishna by creating a situation where we have, we're forced to take shelter of Krishna. The gopis, <coughs> well, I'll just fast forward a little bit. When Krishna put them in a difficult situation where their clothes were on the banks of the Jamuna, and they were in the water, and the water was freezing cold. And they were in the water too long. And Krishna said, if you want your clothes, you're going to have to come out and get them. <laughs> and they didn't want to do that. But Krishna said, this is the only way my, your desires will be fulfilled. Now, this wasn't 
Maya's arrangement, it was the arrangement of the internal energy, Krishna, directly to, to get them to come to the point of accepting Krishna exclusively as their husband. <laughs> and they accepted that. And because of that, the, the gopis are glorious in the sense that there's nothing they won't do to please Krishna. <laughs> That's the glory of the gopis. Even sacrificing everything which is, what we say, worthy of social respectability, even spiritual respectability, they were willing to give everything up just to satisfy Krishna. Satisfying Krishna is actually the goal. What do we have to do to satisfy Krishna? Krishna doesn't give us too much difficulties, right? Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Associate with devotees. Read Srimad Bhagavatam. And use your time for service. But sometimes we feel like, I'm doing so much for Krishna. And Krishna is asking me to do more. Or Krishna is asking me to surrender more. Krishna's devotees are asking me to to surrender more. One should think, wow, that's an opportunity for spiritual advancement. Not that, oh, is there a limit to this surrender? <laughs> no, there's no limit. <laughs> if you study the lives of the gopis, you see, even they were fully surrendered and fully in love with Krishna, but yet Krishna put them into difficult situations. But it wasn't really difficult for them because when there's love, there's no difficulty. Love makes everything easy. When there's no love, then what we call austerity is austerity. When there's love, then austerity actually becomes an expression of love towards the beloved. It's no longer a form of difficulty. <clears throat> but in the beginning, things are difficult or what we say, not easy to perform. In other words, we can't see the benefit in it. <coughs> we can't see the benefit in it. But after some time, by doing it, <coughs> just like sometimes we don't want to sing during kirtan, but we should sing anyway. We don't want to dance. We should dance for the pleasure of the Lord and for the inspiration of other devotees. <coughs> We may not like the prasadam, but we should honor it as being the mercy of Krishna coming as an opportunity to become purified. So accepting difficulties <clears throat> purifies the mind and heart and creates the mood of surrender. <laughs> That's the whole thing. The mood of surrender is the mood that is the goal. Without the mood of surrender, then picking and choosing becomes more or less, well, we like it or we don't like it. The gopis didn't like what Krishna put, him, put them through, but they did it anyway just to please Krishna. And when Krishna was pleased, then everyone was pleased. But here, back to the essence of this particular purport, is that... Um, they gave up eating whatever else they were eating to eat this kitri. I remember during... I was in New Vrindavan <clears throat> and devotees were eating really nicely. I mean, New Vrindavan was considered one of the best Mahaprasadam places in North America. Radhavindavan Chandra, so many kinds of wonderful milk sweets, sandesh. Mangalarti was sandesh, burfi, sweet rice, uh, koa, para, uh, what else? Uh, cream, and uh, what's that other stuff you make when you boil it and it becomes thick? Huh? Rubbery and what else? I'm on and I know it's getting close to Prashad. You know. It's the other stuff. Was condensed milk. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I was trying to eat with saffron and so many nice things. 
So we were having a a transcendental feast with nice Krishna prasadam. But guess what? Devotees got sick. I mean, really got sick. We were eating too nicely. And a lot of devotees came down with different kinds of sicknesses. And then we decided, well, let's call in one doctor, Ayurvedic doctor. I think it was the first Indian we ever saw in our life. <laughs> he came. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, you guys are eating too nicely. You're going to have to go on some real simple diet for a while. So to kind of like purify it. So we had to eat every meal, breakfast, lunch, and of course there was no supper, but we were eating rice with no salt, no spices, and mung dal that was just really liquidy, boiled, with no spices, no salt. It was miserable. <laughs> it was at least at that time, I thought it was really miserable. And every meal we were eating, the, after a while, devotees thought it was better to fast. <laughs> this, this is really bad news. This is plain rice every day. And then the devotees would eat like tons of rice because you couldn't get satisfied. You're just like... And after you were done, you were thinking, maybe we should break into the Maha cabinet. And so <laughs> but it was really strict. And so that went on for a couple of weeks. And then it worked. It actually worked. And the, our, the devotees' health started coming back. And So Nuvrindavan was notorious for getting sick by eating too much nice prasadam. That happened a couple of times. But I remember, I don't know if this is like Havishyana, but it was pretty close. <laughs> it was miserable. But anyway, the gopis wanted Krishna as their husband, so their austerity was acceptable. I don't think Krishna will ask you to do that. I think... Our austerity is somehow or other to work together in a cooperative way to push on Krishna consciousness, to chant the holy names of the Lord, and to undergo the difficulties that come by way of devotional service. Krishna consciousness is so nice. <clears throat> and to detach ourselves from material life. So... Now, I remember so many stories in New Vrindavan. Another time we were drinking too much milk. <clears throat> the devotees at night would have just this hot milk prasadam. And that was the only... We'd have hot milk. That's the only thing. And we were drinking like these big, gigantic bowls of milk. In a big bowl. And they would drink about like <laughs> like a liter of milk at night. <laughs> And it was nice and creamy from right from the cows, sweetened so nicely. And then devotees got sick again. We got, uh, what was it, uh, hepatitis. And then uh, Prabhupada came. And Prabhupada said, you're drinking too much milk. <laughs> so then he made a famous statement, which was repeated later many times, that he said, you should only take one half pound of milk per day and minimum and one pound maximum and then he went on to explain that means all milk products like so you have to calculate sandesh burfi whatever everything else and see if you're, done, you're taking more than a pound I guess I don't know how much that is in neither in millimeter milliliters but a pound is 17.2 ounces and there's two and a half, two and a half, two and a half milliliters in an ounce or something like that. Anyway, it's not very much. It's not very much. And so Prabhupada gave us a restriction like that. And it worked. And our devotees got well again. So austerity in the form of eating. Eat simply, eat for health, 
I don't eat too much. <laughs> Here it says, they ate only unspiced kitchri. <laughs> unspiced kitchri. So I'm trying to go all the way to 9.34, which is breakfast time. <laughs> so you can get ready for the breakfast here. That's the actual breakfast this time. It's a little bit more of an austere. It's not like the, the gopis, you had to do it for months. It's only another 15 minutes. But my class is, more, I guess, more difficult to accept than the gopis' austerity. So... <laughs> So anyway, this is a beautiful chapter. It really takes you into the heart of surrender, into the heart of bhakti. One can never understand the love of the gopis. The, love, the gopis' love is impossible to understand. And of course, the, the pinnacle of that love, or the epitome of that love, is Radharani's love. And even Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or even Krishna himself, becomes Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu just to understand Radharani's bhakti. Even Krishna, Krishna knows everything at all times and all places. But still, he, wasn't be, he, he couldn't fully comprehend Radharani's love for himself, so he becomes Sri Krishna, Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the gopis and their love for Krishna is the perfection of all love. <laughs> What is that nature of the love that's selfless? Mm -hmm. it's, it has no personal motivation, no personal needs for fulfillment, only to satisfy Krishna. And when Krishna sees that, then he becomes the same way. He only thinks how to satisfy his devotees. So when the devotees think how to please Krishna, or how to please Krishna by pleasing Krishna devotees, and Krishna pours his mercy into the heart of that devotee. So we try to serve in such a way that Krishna is pleased and the devotees are inspired in devotional service. So we can study carefully the love of the gopis in their, in their different pastimes. One cannot imitate that. To imitate that would cause one to possibly fall down in devotional service. But one should understand what is the highest. And one should perform their devotional service according to the level of their practice. And one should understand at what level one is practicing devotional service. One can tell, someone asked me, how can we understand we're making advancement in the process of chanting Hare Krishna? I got that question this morning during Japa. <laughs> How can we understand that we're making progress in the process of chanting Hare Krishna? I was thinking how to answer the question. But the first thing that came into my mind was that when we're losing our attraction to the material energy and we're becoming more attracted to associate with devotees and, chant the, and to chant the holy name, then that is an indication that we're making progress in the process of chanting Hare Krishna. Material energy is always providing some opportunity for attraction. Mm -hmm. You get over one type of attraction and then there's another one. <laughs> you get another type of uh, attraction and Maya comes up with another. And that's Maya's business, somehow or other, to keep us from becoming complacent. Because we see sometimes in the life of devotees that one may climb very high on the spiritual platform and give up all forms of gross sense gratification. But the subtle forms of sense gratification, profit, adoration, and distinction, which come by way of what we say success in devotional service, can cause one to again go back to material gross sense gratification. So one has to purify themselves even from the subtle forms of sense gratification which come in the form of wanting to be honored, wanting to be facilitated, wanting, wanting to be, what we say, looking for some kind of success, uh, success in devotional service, some material success, whatever it may be. But devotional service 
Pure devotional service is abhyala sita suna jnana kamar anavritam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti. It's free from everything material and it's simply focused on Krishna for the pleasure of Krishna. That's all. So this this is a great science. Bhakti is a great science. How to think at every moment how to please Krishna. And the best way is to practice chanting Hare Krishna. Because if we're always connected with Krishna through the holy name, Krishna will always, through the process of chanting, inspire us to engage in his devotional service. We'll always have the intelligence how to please Krishna. So, chant, of course, chanting itself is pleasing to Krishna, and it's the highest form of purification. But in the execution of our devotional service, we need that intelligence to serve in such a way that Krishna is pleased by that. And that's the subtle forms of devotional service. So when we're always connected to Krishna through the holy name, then the holy name will inspire us how to serve nicely. Because the holy name is the complete shelter in this age. We take shelter of the deity, but we can only take shelter of the deity when we are actually fully taking shelter of Krishna's holy name. Then the deity becomes manifested through the shelter of the holy name. And purifying ourselves through the process of chanting. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. So thank you. I apologize for this class. I wasn't prepared for the class. So uh, thank you for your tolerance. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Anything? <laughs> yes, uh, Nirada, Nivi, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you, Maharaj. Were you there in New Vrindavan when they uh, were serving out this horse feed to all the devotees? Maharaj was telling how that's at one point it was really poor and they had very little. Yeah. Well, I was. I think that's when I first came. They started to change. <laughs> I came around 1973. Radhanath Maharaj tells, it that, tells about that when he was asked to get some uh, oats for the devotees' breakfast. And he couldn't find the oats. And then after being directed many times, finally he said, all I could find is a bag that says oat feed on it. And the cook said, yeah, well, that's what we usually use for the devotees. Mm-hmm. Oh, it said horse, horse feed. So we were feeding the horses, the cows, and the devotees the same thing. <laughs> and there was little pieces of straw in it, I remember. <laughs> you could find some straw and some other things, you know, I'm not really sure what they were, little kernels of hard pieces of things. For horses, it's no problem. But because we work like a horse, <laughs> so <laughs> I thought they thought maybe that was the appropriate prashadam. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I think I came right around that time when we decided to kind of like switch over. <laughs> and then we started buying farina. I think we were still getting government surplus oats, though. The government was giving us free. Uh, food in different forms and uh, we used to get this oats packaged by the government and it was free. And I used to make that for the devotees because I was the cook at the time. And it was just raw and you couldn't eat it the way it was and if you cooked it it became really like I don't know what you say to use a very descriptive word kind of slimy you know what slimy is? <laughs> it's just like gooey. Yeah, gooey and slippery. So I would have to toast it in a frying pan first to just to make it a little bit palatable. And then we were eating that. So 
Austerity. <laughs> that was actually a luxury compared to the other austerities in New Vrindavan. <laughs> I remember we had no cold water. I mean, no hot water. There was no... ICC Radha Gopinathji Ki Jai. So that was one of many austerities. <laughs> but the austerity in this age, Yajyai Sankirtana Prayaya Jantihi Sumeda Saha, is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And you know, when you study Srila Prabhupada's statements regarding the chanting of the Holy Name, you really understand he's basically saying the 16 rounds is just the beginning, 16 rounds is just to get you started. Because the goal is really to remember Krishna all the time by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Rama. So we want to chant to come to the point of always wanting to chant. That's actually Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that. That chanting every day will bring you to the point of chanting always. Mm-hmm. So therefore, the more we chant and the, mo- the, m- the more we chant with quality the more we become attached to chanting and more we feel happy only chanting and unhappy when we're not connected to Krishna's holy name and serving devotees of course okay I don't know that's there's a lot of stories related to horse feed but I don't think it's really... I think right now you're getting breakfast. I think it might be a little bit better than that. I hope. (laughs) Pretty sure it is. (laughs) This is my first visit in about three months. And I don't remember what breakfast is like. So anyway, it's always nice. The prashadam here is always nice. Prabhupada said, have nice prashadam for the devotees. He said, give them nice prashadam and work hard. (laughs) for Krishna <laughs> in other words stay engaged in devotional service and so prasadam should be always nice and healthy and you know, say not too heavy <laughs> where you want to go to sleep afterwards <laughs> ok anything else <laughs> thank you Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai